at all. So anyhow, back in the Element Well studios, Russ Latino, the president of Empower Mississippi. Russ, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. It's been a little while. It has. It has. Uh, nothing's going on, though, so we can just close it up now. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about, uh, we're, we're going, we had you here because we want to talk about this whole student loan situation, but the city of Jackson. I know you have got uh, some feelings on that, <laughs> needless to say. Um, uh, you being the uh, well-thought uh, policy uh, intellect that you are, always appreciate your insight. Uh, I've got some feelings on it as well, as you might sure, might expect. sure. But this you is— You being the well-thought policy well, intellect that you are. I don't know about that. I appreciate that. I don't know about that. But, you, you know, it, uh, it's just a common-sense sort of deal. We've been talking a lot about uh, how do we get here. And certainly, we we need to do uh, some introspect analysis of that. No doubt about it. But mainly so it doesn't happen again. I mean, a, we can't fix what happened in the past. How we get here? But the biggest thing is, where do we go from here? And uh, I'm hearing everything from let's get the federal government uh, to just write a check, bail the city out. Uh, there are some rumors that the state may exercise its authority, and I must admit. I'm not familiar with what sort of authority maybe you can help us with that the state would have in terms of so-called taking over the city. There's rumors of that, as you know, swirling around. Um, and, and then, so you got that going on. And then there's also ideas that you were just sharing with before we uh, came on the air about, well, let's go ahead and get the ARPA money yeah. that was showered upon us. Let's get that uh in the works and get something going. Well, Your thoughts? Yeah, a few thoughts. I mean, one, I think we've got to have a strong Jackson to have a strong Mississippi. It's our capital Agreed. city. Uh, we need to to all be a part of figuring out how to fix the problems that are there, and they're substantial problems. I think we've got to stop ignoring the fact that there are problems there for fear of of uh, accusations uh, because of some of the delicacies associated with um, the the city and the way that people perceive the city. I think that we've got to look at it and say, okay, there's this massive problem with water. It's unsafe for the people to drink. It's unsafe for people to live their lives. It's unsafe for businesses to operate and make living. Um, and so we got to do something about it. There are, to me, the the importance of understanding the problem isn't just so that we don't repeat it. It's designing a solution requires us to understand how we got oh, there. Oh, sure. Um, and so I would say this is not something that is a byproduct of flooding. Flooding is the straw that broke the camel's back. This is a decades-in-the-making problem with deferred maintenance on a system. It's a decades-in-the-making problem with failure to actually bill for water, which means there's insufficient funds to maintain the system. Agree. A and it's a failure in terms of staffing. Uh, OB Curtis is not that old of a facility. It really isn't. I think it's 20, 20 years old, give right, or take. Right, right. Um, we just have inadequate staffing. In fact, the EPA has said that we have inadequate qualified staffing to, to run the thing. So all of those are, are real sort of long-term problems that have to be addressed if you want to fix it. I'd look at it, though, and say this, that there are numbers floating around that people have thrown out about what it would take to fix it. Nobody knows because the analysis that's required to really know what is wrong with the system has not been done. And it costs money and it, to and do it, the analysis. And it does cost money. Um, but I also know that the city of Jackson got $42 million in American Rescue Plan Act money, um, which they are allowed to use for water infrastructure. Right. I know that Hines County got $45 million uh, directly, uh, their portion. And you look at that, and you're talking about $87 million that could immediately be applied to the problem. And then you realize the state opened up their ARPA money to matching. So if Jackson and Hines County decide to put all $87 million up into the state's matching program, we're talking about $174 million in quick access that can be used to fix OB Curtis, to fix the meter system, because after all of this, we still don't have uh, a system that really works for billing in Jackson. Um, you look at all of that and you go, that's a real start. And so even if you accept some of the ridiculous numbers that are floating around, it would cost $2 billion to replace the entire system sort of thing. you got to realize that it's better to spend $174 million now to get water back to people immediately, take one bite at the elephant, and then we can talk about what a long-term plan looks like to finish eating the elephant. Yeah, I mean, we at least got to get back to a point where we have functioning flow of 
potable water. I mean, that's that's the problem we have right now. And you can't have economic activity without that. Yep. And you can't produce revenue without economic activity. So it's a huge old catch-22, but we got to at least get back to that. Well, it becomes a death spiral, right? Um, you, to your point, if business goes out of Jackson – then employment goes out of Jackson, um, and your your tax base gets smaller and smaller, so your ability to actually address these things gets harder and harder. I, I do think at some level it's worth considering the idea that, one, some of the problems that Jackson's facing are not wholly Jackson in the sense that geographically the reservoir and the Pearl River contribute to some of the issues that Agree. they deal with. Agree. And those are, you know, those come through communities that are not Jackson. Um, so in a, in a degree, it is a regional question. Um, and then the, the system itself is not limited to Jackson proper, right? Um, certainly there are services that are offered as far north as Ridgeland um, with sewage. Um, and there is water service that's offered all the way down to Byram. Right. So you look at that and go, well, perhaps the right approach to this is something similar to what Haley Barber did post-Katrina with a regional utility district that allows people who have a stake in the game in the area to have a voice in how resources get spent to fix the problem, recognizing that the impact of the problem extends beyond Jackson proper. Yep. yep. Yeah, to- totally agree. Uh, and and also, uh, also totally accept and appreciate your assessment that we, can, we can't just write the city off within the state. It, it, uh, we are all affected positively and negatively by the status uh, of the city, of the capital city. 100%. Um, we need to be committed to a strong Jackson. That's not a, a white versus black thing. Right. It's not a Republican versus Democrat thing. The state needs a strong capital city. Right. Um, and the reality is, you know, a lot of people want to put these things in terms of, of sort of polarizing concepts. You're in team Republican or team Democrat. This is somehow a racial question. It's none of those things. There are white people who are living in Jackson that are being affected. There are black people who are living in Jackson that are being affected. And until we stop deflecting from our faults by pointing fingers at other people, we're not going to fix the problems that are ultimately in the interest of the people that we're supposed to be serving. And I think, you know, I think this has got to be a state and local solution where we come together, figure out. The extent of the problem, the cost of fixing it, a timeline, and who's going to execute it, and then put the resources to bear to fix the problem. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, however, uh, from an accountability perspective, I, I think it's fair to say that there is a low level of confidence that uh, this large amount of money, you, you, you pointed out, we could get to $175 million pretty rapidly. But to just transfer that to the current administration and, and it, for, for it to be overseen by them, I think is problematic for most people. I, I think you're looking at it from the perspective of if you're using state money, which includes state taxpayer money from places that are not Jackson, right? then state leaders owe it to somebody in Tishomingo County totally agree. to be able to say, hey, look, we're going to use some of your resources to invest in the capital city, um, but we're going to make sure that it gets used responsibly. Um, and and you look at the context of we're in the middle of litigation right now where the mayor of Jackson tried to veto the veto of his own city council, which is an absurd concept, <laughs> um, to hire his own garbage crew. So what you can't possibly do is open yourself up to the scenario where there's a Richard's Water Service suddenly doing things, Right. There, there's got to be an actionable plan that the state can say, we're willing to invest in that plan. It can't just be a demand for revenue. I agree with you, and, I, and I'll say again, I, I still think a lot of these problems are rooted in the uh, deeply flawed and corrupt procurement process we have in the state. I just do. And that's been going on for a long time. We got Russ Latino, president of Empower Mississippi. We'll continue this discussion, and then we're going to start talking about this whole student loan situation <laughs> like we don't have enough on our plate here. We're coming right back. We're in the Element. We are back in the Element Well Studios. Our guest is Russ Latino, president of Empower Mississippi. So, Russ, on the ceasefire text line, you were talking about the, uh, the money that could be made available in fairly short order, which includes some matching funds from the state in accordance to, to the state program to do so. 
And uh, so the question is, is this discussion about giving all of the ARPA and matching monies to one city's broken system without regard of others? No, no we're not no, suggesting that. I mean, that. Uh, my recollection is what one point eight billion was right. the state kitty so, to the state. Right. So, so we'd be talking about eighty seven million of that one point eight billion. Right. Um, that would be applied to, to one city to then the county to, to the Jackson, well, Jackson and Hines County. And then again, like I said, there are elements of that water and sewage system that affect even up into Madison County. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but it's also if you look at it in terms of population. Um, you know, it's our largest population center as well. No doubt. So it would it would not be an unreasonable investment of the resources given the dire need, given the size of the population, the percentage of the overall sort of pot that we're talking about. I think what you need to ensure is that there's an actual plan to do something with it that actually benefits the people of Jackson. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So, and I can tell you, uh, folks, that uh, every state, uh, excuse me, every city leader that I have interviewed uh, since the ARPA was uh, enacted, a number, of course, at the Mississippi Municipal League Conference, but several others, of course, over the last year, I've always asked them, do you have your plan? Have you submitted your plan to the state for your matching piece? Because if you remember Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman, that was like the first thing out of his mouth when that money came down is, you cities, we're going to do this matching thing. Go get your plans together and make yeah. sure that you can participate here. Well, so. tomorrow, tomorrow is, the uh, I, my understanding, the opening of the application process. That's for right. That. That's so, right. So literally, if you think about this in terms of timing, if Jackson has a plan, if they've been preparing for this, Knowing that there's been a problem for years and the EPA has been entering consent orders and everything else for right. years, right. if they know how to fix it and the money has been the problem, they can put a plan on someone's desk tomorrow yep. to start getting matching funds. Totally agree. I, I just believe it needs to be done uh, with proper oversight that sure. uh, is independent of the city. And, so. and look, if they don't have a plan, then they need to uh, to exercise the humility of saying we need help figuring out how to fix this. I totally thing. agree. Totally agree. And uh, the the mayor did indicate yesterday that he is uh, he is grateful for uh, the assistance. He welcomes the state's help. So we'll see where that goes. That's what he said. "Quote: We are grateful for the assistance." Unquote. So hopefully something will happen because. Uh, and this also, unfortunately, as you know, Russ, it reflects on the state across the country, the perception out there. I have actually received some calls from, from friends outside of Mississippi. You guys okay? You have water? Yeah. I understand because, you know, they, it's, they don't know where the boundaries are and whose system's serving who, and it's making national news. It's not uh, the good kind of news you want for the state of Mississippi. So, And then you've got – how this affects economic development as well when you have these kinds of things going on. No water, no power, no economic development projects. So. Which, which is why it's a bigger-than-Jackson problem, right? Agree. Um, there's a lot of human suffering going on in Jackson right now, but if you want to talk about why somebody in Biloxi should care about this, it's because the impact on the state's economy is pretty substantial. No doubt about it. No, absolutely no doubt about it. All right. Uh, student loans. I know you've written a piece on that as well. Sure. You've got uh, some uh, some uh, some very deep feelings, and, and I do as well. But we kind of knew this was coming. I felt like it was. And, and you know, I think the, the uh, impetus was that the, uh, the moratorium on the pause on repayment was scheduled uh, to expire today. As a matter of fact, and I think that they, the Democrats effectively pushed the president into, OK, well, you don't want that to happen on your watch in advance of midterms and everybody's got to resume payment of their student loans. Why don't you just go ahead and wipe out some of this debt? And by the way, extend the moratorium out till after the midterms as well. Yeah, um, you know, there, there are multiple layers to this thing. The first thing I would say is that there are serious questions about the constitutionality of the act itself. Uh, it will end up being challenged in court, and I suspect it will end up being getting heard by the Supreme Court at some stage, uh, whether or not the president can just waive uh, debt uh, through executive order is questionable. Um, so there's that. I, I think there's the element of this that is potentially inflationary, 
even though it might feel nice if you're a beneficiary. Uh, Jason Furman, who was uh, President Obama's senior economic advisor, has come out and said, this is actually really bad policy the way this was designed. It's going to contribute to the inflationary environment that we're in. Yep. Um, so there's the, the sort of larger macro effect that arguably is negative. You know, I, I think a lot of conservatives will look at it and just say, as a matter of principle, you agreed to, to pay back a debt for a service that was being given. You need to pay your debt. Um, I look at it uh, uh, with a little bit more nuance than, than that in this sense. I, I do think that people should exercise personal responsibility. But I think the entire system is broken. I think the entire system of financing college, the import that we put on college for everyone – is broken, and part of that is because student loans are back federally. So you know this, that if you want to go buy a car right now, you'd go and you'd say, here's my income level, here are my assets, and then the bank's going to make a decision on whether or not they're going to give you money to buy that car. So they're actually an, analyzing the risk associated with giving you the money. Student loans don't have that, and it's because the federal government backs them. That's right. So there's no risk profile created. There's no cost-benefit analysis considered. There's no consideration of ability to repay or what default might look like. Those are all things that normally would be associated with lending practices. So if you're a college, the great thing about that is – you don't it doesn't matter whether or not you're providing valuable education to someone such that they can get out and be more marketable than when they got there it doesn't matter if a student who's taking underwater basket weaving or something you know sure. goofy yep. um is going to be more productive once they get out because if they can't pay it back the federal government's going to take care of it yep. um and so there's no incentive on the part of the college to make sure that the scope of education is such that if all this money is being taken out in loans by students, that at the end of the day, that value is added back in their ability to go out and make a higher salary. Sure. So absent that, we've got a system where there's moral hazard, both on the part of the student who just sees free money and on the part of the college that is less concerned about the actual outcome of a kid coming out of college. Um, to me, that's a recipe for disaster. And candidly, just forgiving student loans doesn't fix it at all. Right. Um, you know, in fact, all it does is make it more likely uh, that that system continues where there's not a direct connection between the money being taken out of loans and the value that is added to the student who takes out that money in loans. Yeah. Uh, a, a great analysis. Appreciate that, Russ. So, you know, a couple of things I'll, I'll make a point of is that a lot of people, rightfully so, are angered because this is a targeted group. This is a targeted group. This only benefits directly those who actually presently have student loans. That's who it benefits. And, of course, only if their income is below the $125,000 threshold or two fifty dollars for a household. So those who don't have student loans, those who paid off their student loans. Those who consolidated their student loans. I got you. I hear you. I understand. Yeah. So it's all that uh, means that you're excluded from the group of beneficiaries, and so it is rightfully perceived as unfair. And those that are not benefiting feel like, well, I'm paying for a benefit you're getting. I get all that, but I'll just point this out: the government's not going to send those who are feel like they're absorbing the cost of of uh, others. They're not going to send you a bill for it. Uh, they're not going to raise your taxes for it. How it manifests, if at all, would be through the inflationary impact. Sure. But on the other hand, why don't we equally get incensed at the um, at the $30 trillion of debt we have on the books, uh, over a third of which came about in the last three years, Sure. which is the reason we got 8.5% uh, uh, inflation right now. So... It, this is one percent of that. I'm not saying it's nothing, but it depends on whose math you look at. But somewhere between one and two percent. So, so where I would not even disagree with you, but just add some some color commentary is, okay. you're right in the sense that current taxpayers aren't suddenly going to pay back. Right? There's not going to be a bill sent to Gerard saying, "Hey, Russ got a ten thousand dollar check. Will you contribute a dollar fifty? Right. But. I do think that you're in a scenario where you're making the economy considerably weaker over time. Not you're creating moral hazard. And it's future taxpayers that are on the line for this. It's not people right now. It's, it's, 
it's a deferred cost on the future taxpayers Agree. because of the $30 trillion in debt. Agree. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add this nuance to this. It's really not taxpayers. It's all consumers. Sure. Th- th- this brunt that we'll have to bear, financial burden we'll have to bear, it's not taxpayers. It's everybody. Not just taxpayers. Yeah. It's not like, because, hell, we know now half the, tax, half the households didn't pay any taxes. You hang around? We yeah, talk some more. We got Russ Latino, president of Empower Mississippi, in the Element Well Studios. We'll be right back. 